So without further ado, I'll pass over to Sophie. Here we go. Hi Jennifer, lovely to be here with us today. Um, so we, we're very lucky to have actually uh, Jennifer here because she's well involved in, uh, in fashion, uh, secure, in the circular fashion, as well as sustainability in general. Um, and I think, you know, like we all know the why, so this is not what we're going to talk about. But what we love with um, the work that Jennifer does is that this is a very practical one to help um, the companies uh, either starting a business to be, to be circular straight away in the fashion industry or transitioning to circular business models. Um, so I guess it's probably what I would love to explore a little bit more with you today. And I'd love to start is asking you, you know, what are the points of consideration at the starting point? For us, when we, so at QSA, we help businesses um, create, oh, oh, did you want, what? No, no, did you no, forget I, about my item? I totally forgot about your item. This is exactly, I was like, oh no. <laughs> it's a bit difficult to say. Yeah, it's a bit of a different one. Oh, there's so, many different um, we need to ask Jennifer about a circular conversation. Okay, so this, it might not be everybody's style, but this is a, this is what's um, a company called painterjacket.com. Um, and what they do is they do made to order clothing and they've come up with this utility jacket. Um, and over the period of time, they have set drops. So you go online and you or it's made to order. So um, basically, it's a young couple that that were really fed up with the amount of waste that's produced by the fashion industry and the amount of over ordering and overstock. So what they is kind of called a fashion drop. So. Although to go circular, we'd really, we'd really prefer people didn't buy things. When you do want to buy something, you do want to be fashionable and have a really great garment. How can you do that in a circular and ethical way? So it's about designing out waste, which is one of the tenets of circular circularity. So it's my really nice jacket. Uh, <laughs> and they have another drop. They have another drop um, in a few days. What, so people sign up to the website and then you pre-order and they only make 500 jackets. So there's no waste, there's no waste in the production. They go to Italy and, and they, they have it all woven in Portugal, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, so I think it epitomizes the fact that people, we still have to recognize that people do want to buy things and actually we know the heart of, of reducing our impact in the fashion industry is, is to consume less, but if people are going to consume, how can we do that in a better way? So it's possibly, is it circular in the sense that it's a designing out waste, then that is one of the ways. And I think that really brings you back to that, your question that you sort of said there, Sophie, about what's the first thing you should think about when you want to go circular. And the first thing you should think about, as far as we're concerned, is your customer. I mean, there's no point in you creating an amazing business model if you don't have a market. So you really need to know your customer. And where we've worked at QSA, helping businesses create a new circular model the customer has always been at the heart of it and they always know what their customer wants and how their customer behaves and what behavior they want to adapt and change and influence. So that's really that key thing. And that's really interesting what you're saying here because I think there is the aspect of knowing them and answering that. And I'm also wondering, you know, what the role that brands can do in, in helping their customers change behaviors. Yeah, and I think by having that model that, that plays to what your customer's looking for, We've had business models that have been successful that we've launched with people like um, Farfetch and Adidas, um, but we've had other companies that haven't gone all the way through our process. They've fallen at the second or third stage. So there are failures on our, you know, on the support or, or in helping people get to business models. And the main reason there's been two things is they don't know their customer. And the second thing is, is a lot about the data and IT capability. Because knowing your customer's part about where do you collect that information from and a lot of it's tied around data and then being able to have an IT system that can take on board whether you're buying back, reselling, hiring, etc, etc. So, yeah. yeah. That's really interesting, knowing where you stand, having that data so you can also measure, I guess, the improvement over time in the channel. Yeah. And we recognise that there are some brands and there is some fashion brands out there that won't ever adopt a circular model. So, it is about helping the ones that do have that opportunity and do have that, that um, I guess, the desire and the appropriate customer base. We know Primark aren't going to hire clothes, for example, but we've got people at her who are hiring clothes. So it's being appropriate for your customer. So it's back to, do you know your customer? 
Yeah, yeah, back to the basics of business. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so when looking at um, the fashion one, which models do you see really emerging? Business models. Well, what tends to happen is at the moment, and this, you know, we've got, we keep a database of everything that's popping up and everything that we track. And then we've got an, over 120 examples sitting at, at, at the moment in a sort of case study file. But really where it all starts with, and it's the easier thing to do for businesses is, is the take back schemes you know that does start to embed that circular behavior within you know going beyond re just donating for recycling but actually taking back product perhaps a buyback model that we've seen somewhere like we helped add to this with their infinite play and actually on furniture you'll have seen ikea are now buying back so actually they did a trial on that and that's now launching so really is about starting where you can see an opportunity on on buyback and resale and we say to a lot of the retailers that we work with there is absolutely no excuse in this day and age why you wouldn't be able to do a take back offer so we know we've got bring banks and supermarket car parks we've got brings clothing into store we've got services like thrift plus um oxfam are now sending out a bag where you can send your clothes back um so but then of course the flip side of that is well what happens to all that so you then have to enable that resale model. And if you've seen really what's been quite exciting in the last few days is Asda. Now I've got 50 stores where they're doing a resale pop-up and it's part of the core business. They trialled it at Milton Keynes um, and they trialled it in their Middleton sustainability store in Leeds and the fact that they're now rolling that out. So then what we say is, is that that whole take back, whether it's for a reward or whether it's donation and then resale is becoming more and more mainstream, which is great. So the next thing is, how do we move that through the business model process? And if you look at any business model mapping, you know, the, the, the sort of resale is the, is the first step. And then you start to go, well, how do we take them down that route to things such as rental, for, for example, you know, push your customer from bringing back, buying secondhand to, well, actually, let's consume less, let's rent our clothes. How do we push that? And there's loads of that. If I added us this week, just set out, um, just launched a new business model on rental, which is fantastic. You've got the likes of um, Her, which had a plug-in in Selfridges. So really going from mass market, I guess, like Adidas through to something more niche and bricks and mortar, which is Selfridges. So starting to push that through. And then so how do we get them through to subscription models? Things like <clears throat> the most common one you probably hear of, well, I'm sorry, it's unfair to say that if you're in the fashion industry, but things like mud jeans, you know, or the everlasting hoodie or any of those subscription services where you pay a, you know, a monthly or a or an annual or a pair of garment price and you always keep switching it out. Um, Ralph Lauren just um, in America have just launched a, a monthly subscription. So you pay a monthly subscription and then you get a package of clothing and then that gets back into the loop. So you only own it for that period of time. And I guess it's a bit about, you know, do you need to own your clothes and to be truly circular, where is that tipping point between being fashionable and not over consuming and doing the right thing for the planet? And the other thing I don't know if any of you have seen is that we're now starting to see virtual wardrobes. Some of the brands are starting to put virtual clothing and footwear on the market that you can buy. And for somebody who's a bit older, it seems a bit weird. But um, Gucci were doing a, are doing a virtual trainer that you can buy and then you, you, you can just put that on your Instagram account. So you've got brand new trainers and all your pictures, um, but you haven't consumed and you haven't created, you know, waste or something that's going to languish at the bottom of your wardrobe and not be reworn again. So really start to think about that. And we're, we're looking at that. Um, I'm working on a project at the moment with the British Fashion Council, Institute of Positive Fashion, and we're creating a, a, a um, circular fashion ecosystem for them. And, you know, looking at that digitization and virtual is becoming more commonplace. How does that tie in and how does that help us be more circular, reduce consumption, reduce waste? Um, yeah, so perhaps slightly out of our, well, certainly out of my comfort zone. I think if I was just spend £25, I'd quite like to have the thing, but that's an attitude that we, we're building on and, and, and need to change. So I guess you go from, you know, the, the sort of resale right through to that virtual. So there's the kind of the polar opposites of the circular system for fashion. It's really, there's just so much. We could talk so much about Oh yeah, I mean, so much <laughs> to unpack in that. 
Uh, but I guess there, there's two, probably two co points that really stood out. One is that, you know, you talked about the putting the customer needs there and then all the different models. And what I find quite interesting is that it actually creates almost new touch points uh, for yeah. to interact with their customers um, in a different way. So I was just wondering, could you touch a little bit more about that in terms of, because there is a business case we need to build, but also the retail yeah. aspect. Could you touch a little bit more about that? Yeah, and I think back to that heart of knowing who your customers are and you want, you know, we know in retail and fashion, it's all about brand loyalty and keeping your customers with you. And I think over COVID, that's been quite interesting. There's been a lot of switching. You know, we know, for example, Next has done particularly well because they've taken market share from the likes of Primark because Primark was shut. So if you've got, you know, you wanted to buy basics, children's pyjamas, t-shirts, there's been a switch there. But really about the circularity, what business models are about keeping that customer with you, about building the brand loyalty. Is particularly if you do move to a service model because you're capturing that that individual um, and then encourage them to really tie into your brand. And I think where that works particularly is on brands that do have an internet presence and are doing online because they have a direct relationship with a customer. They know who the customer is and they can influence them. So whether it's you know through their 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 Instagram or through the, their actual direct marketing. I mean, one of the things we've looked at is particularly with some of people like ASOS and Boohoo, when you do go online to buy through them, there hasn't been anything on their website that then connects you to an alternative model. So there is a big opportunity on comms there to reach those people. And you think, well, for people like Boohoo and, and ASOS, it's surely it's a no-brainer because you don't need to run a massive marketing campaign. You already know who they are. Um, and particularly Next as well with the, their strong online offer and, and massive customer base. So it really helps to retain, if you can build the customers through those models, then you can retain them for longer and, and obviously ultimately it comes down to making a profit. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, I think it's really that that's a part that absolutely fascinates me because I really think we can connect on such a different level and and build a strong relationship, which is what brands ultimately really want. Yeah. Uh, you touched on um, on some of the commercial aspects as well. So when we're looking at transitioning, often when we start, it feels like some of those um, particular models or sustainable models can be perceived as expensive or more expensive. So I was wondering, you know, like what's your take on the commercial viability of the transition? Yeah, I mean, commercial viability starts is at the heart of what we do. We have at QSE a tried and tested business model creation process. So we have tried it with probably over 20 plus businesses, some in fashion, and we've also worked with Ikea, Samsung, um, River Simple, um, quite a few other brand, other types of businesses, Bandwalk Tires. Um, but if it doesn't make you money and isn't commercial, it will never work. So the very first step is, you know, we have those innovation sessions with the with the, um, the company, but not only just bringing in your sustainability manager, you need to bring your commercial team to the table and your marketing and comms team. This is not a niche business model. This is about converting your whole business and you need to get buy-in across all of the functions within a business. If you haven't got the CFO bought in, commercial team bought in, it won't happen. So once you've created those innovative ideas, we start moving through that feasibility and business case. And again, that's just, we've got, we've got processes that help us do that. But really, if it doesn't make a profit, well, you're not going to get by and you're not going to get the time, you're not going to get the airplay internally, you're not going to get the resources. And um, one of the things that we've done is, is when we look at the seven C's of circularity, which puts the customer at the heart of it, but that ties into the business case, it ties into the business change process. Um, and what I was just saying there is that we do have a seven step process and then we have the seven C's of circularity in our model and we've created an online learning platform which is free for you to have a look at so you can look at that after this call and, and, and see what I'm talking about I'm not going to we're not sharing hundreds of slides because this is a chat but it gives you an opportunity to look at how you could run that model and what the steps are we've put that open source for the moment so do log in I was going to say if we put the, the the link on the chat and on the follow-up um, and it gives you that visibility of what all the steps you need to go through to, to create that business model and ultimately still make a profit. All right, so thank you so much for sharing that with us. It's literally a step-by-step -step guide. Um, yeah, perhaps. yeah, and we've taken, I mean, it is tried and tested. We've taken lots of organizations through it and we've also had organizations 
because it's got a stage gate process. We've had organisations that have got to a stage and then they haven't been able to move forward. So there are decision points there as well. So that makes it very clear. There's not a whole load of consultants coming in and talking a whole load of stuff and having no output. Um, yeah, so it's been really successful. So do have a look at the, the learning platform. There we go. He is in the chat, Erica. Just yep. Thank you for that. <laughs> That's wonderful. Okay. Um, I had like, I'm fascinated with the tech aspect, but maybe we... Yeah. That, uh, well, I guess if you've got any points here, let us know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, ultimately, you get tech, is, tech and data is the answer. It's, it's for everything. I mean, I went up to Scotland a few weeks ago um, and saw a company called ACS, who are a fulfillment centre, a uh, fulfillment business. So they can provide a retailer or a brand or an organisation with a full service model. If you want to do a higher model, you can buy it off the shelf from them. And it is amazing every single item that goes in and out of their warehouse, which is like huge, I don't know how many thousand square foot, has got a tag on it, a digital tag or a barcode. So it is a data management and fashion service management system. To bring it all together now, absolutely. Right, so we can definitely spend so much more time on this. Yeah. Well, as we get towards the end. So um, there are two final questions I'd like to yeah. ask. The first one, I think it was brilliant to get that overview. And, you know, it's like what we like doing is always bringing you back um, to Reading and what you potentially do. So I was really wondering, you know, if there is one thing that we could do to sort of raise the awareness even further about circular fashion in Reading, what would you say would that be? I think it's about collaboration in Reading, and I know that we've probably touched on that a lot through these conversations, but how do we bring some players together in Reading and create a physical space where we could run some of those models? So, for example, is it a really great looking pop-up shop that has several different types of, whether it's charities or commercial resellers, whether there's a repair centre in the corner, um, and then there's a showcase for any of the online rental anybody locally that does online rental to have, you know, to showcase their products and people come in and touch and feel what they could rent and then they can go online and then rent. So I think there's definitely an opportunity to do that in a professional, really great looking way. I mean, I just, I'm obsessed that, you know, we send all this stuff to charity shops and we end up with this massive mountain of secondhand clothing. Great stuff, looks great, fantastic. But how do we encourage people to then switch to buying secondhand and pre-loved clothing. And we have to do it in a way that looks sexy, that, that, that looks like a really great high street shop. I can't think of any specific examples, but I know in Sweden they have a secondhand department store and everything in there is pre-loved, which once locked down and everything, I, you know, I'm desperate to go and have a look at. Yeah, so yeah, I think there's, a, there's something there about bringing lots of players together into a great looking space and presenting a professional offer for customers. Yeah, well, I love that. I don't know who does it, <laughs> who starts it, or who, who hosts it. Yes, so that's, that could be our challenge in writing. There we go. But I love it. Be. Like, you know, really changing the mindset and sort of the, I guess, the perception that people have around that. And I guess as we are all reopening now for business, hopefully, fingers crossed, <laughs> that could be a brilliant idea, actually, to really yeah. get back together. Maybe so, there's something with IKEA. Maybe in my mind now, thinking IKEA and writing. I know they don't think they're doing the pop up. They would buy back because I did have a look on the website last night because I was like, oh, I've got a few things I could take back. <laughs> so do I. There's definitely, there's definitely loads of opportunity. You've got great, you know, we've got John Lewis, we've got all really good players, Primark, loads of guys that are really interested. How do we bring that together yeah. in Reading? Fantastic. Thank you. Well, so we'll have a think about this one. Um, final question. We always ask uh, our guests to give us an idea or suggestion about someone else to come and be our guest. So if you don't have any specific person in mind, maybe it could be an area that you would like us to explore on this particular conversation. Go fees. Yeah, I think it might, maybe it's quite good to try and find somebody in the Reading area that is doing a circular business model in fashion. I mean, I'm talking about enabling businesses to create a model, but can we find someone who's doing a model? Um, is there anybody locally that's doing higher subscription um, and bring them in? Because again, that starts to build that partnership if we do get to the point where we can create a physical space. So maybe we can have a wee scout through our list of, we've got a database of about 120 at the minute, but try and put a local view on it. I think that would be great. Fantastic, yeah, that sounds good. And I guess we've got quite a few guests as well coming up in the next couple of weeks on some of those topics, so fantastic. Right, so I will pass it back to Erika to answer some of your questions. 
Thank you, Jennifer. <laughs> so if you do have questions, do put them in the chat right now. We had one question actually about if you did want to kind of, you know, a lot of um, people are trying to change their habits and go for more sustainable circular clothing options. Is there a list, you kind of mentioned you've got a database, but is there a list somewhere, particularly I suppose of the high street brands, of those that are actually, you know, make doing is it better, there, more circular? Um, I think, um, I don't think there's such a thing as a list or a database. There is one or mm. two sort of a, a accreditation companies that have, you know, scored some of the retailers, but no, I, there, isn't, there isn't a list. You would have to look at, I mean, I have some, brands I've edited out of my purchasing because I'm not impressed with their credentials yeah. <laughs> so there's a bit of that you know when you go to see one of your favorite brands and they say oh, we don't really do sustainability you're like okay I really don't do buying from you anymore um, and then when you see what brand that you really like like I like really like Hush it has sort of that really sort of casual really nice quality they've got a really great sustainability strategy and we're now working with them on another project and I will continue to choice edit and buy from them so I don't think there's a database. If you're on, I mean, it's not particularly your area, but the press, honestly, we can't keep up with it. You know, every day on Drapers or Business of Fashion or even BBC website, there's another example, yeah. you know, of, of a I bit, think, you know. Yeah, and what I see also, it's quite, it's quite an area also that there's been quite a lot of, you know, greenwashing type elements as well from some businesses that it's really hard to kind of... Um, make make sense sometimes of you know focus maybe on one element but then maybe there's a, another bit of sustainability whether it's the ethics or, or something so all of those those value value decision making um around it as well yeah i think so and I, it depends i mean it's a bit like you take an apple you know what's better to buy a fair trade apple a local apple or an organic apple and the question mm. always is it depends so yeah, yeah. it is the same with fashion, but yeah, I mean, people are being called out a lot for greenwashing and there's been quite a lot in the press about that. We've got another client we work with in um, High Speed One Railway, um, which has nothing to do with fashion. Um, we've been helping them a lot with some of their comms um, and really digging into making sure that they say, you know, when they're doing the right thing, that they say the right thing because it's a big business risk. Yeah, yeah. You know, exactly. the press do jump all over it quite quickly and you'll lose customers if you greenwash. Yeah. And I suppose around from, from the, the customer behaviour um, or the customer kind of perception aspect, we had a question also linked to the seven steps you mentioned. Yeah, I'm just trying how to... how much does the consumer or customer behaviour kind of... Um, we said, I just... Them or, I'm not... Yeah. I'm not... I'm, I'm not ignoring that question. What I was going to try and do is put it in the chat is that we have done research and I was going to put it in the chat. Hold on, just I don't, when I came back with yes. Um, <laughs> oh, we've yeah. done, there's a, a, some consumer research. That's just a link to the web page that the research reports is in there. Um, we have, everything we do is underpinned by consumer research. And um, on our seven step process, once you've got to innovation, um, there is the second part after that is customer and then it's feasibility. So yeah. we would say to you, you need to do the consumer research piece. Otherwise, again, you're just, you know, it's like I had somebody phone me one day and a girl wanted some help because she was thinking about setting up a sustainable clothing brand. And I was like, that's brilliant. Absolutely fantastic. So who's your customer? Oh, I'd like to do clothes that are really sustainable. And I'm like, but who, who's your customer? And how do you define sustainable? Are you making them ethically? Are you reducing the carbon footprint of what you're buying in or... And I think it just would blew her mind. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, <laughs> she was like, oh, well, never thought of all that. Yeah, it's like everything, you know, you, you, there's no easy answer. You have to actually go through the process and think about it like everything else. Yeah. One bit, I know we, oh, I could talk to you for ages about this, Jennifer, but one bit that I was really interested in, and maybe this is a whole other piece, was that role actually moving towards the digital and the role of social media and tech yeah. firms almost of perpetuating some of that that need or desire for people to have to look different or have clothes or or that I, I suppose also the huge yeah. selling bit which is so much around their business models um, well, that's it. as I mean, well so it's yeah there, there's a real tension yeah. isn't it <laughs> there's a tension and like maybe the virtual clothing is is a thing in the future I can't get my head around it but then I can't yeah. get around the fact that I would never I, in the future I could never own a car and just have a driverless vehicle turn up at my door so but I'm a different generation, but I 
yeah, so the digital is becoming important and it is also important to underpin your business case. You know, if you don't know what garments you're selling and when you're selling them and who's buying them and what they're doing with them, if you don't know what the consumers are doing with your clothing that you sell them, you're really going to struggle to provide a business, a new business model for them. Yeah. So we've done loads of research and we work with a really great guy at Ekerol who um, ex Ipsos Mori, he does a lot of research for rap as well. Um, and the British Fashion Council, we're, the next stage of the project for that, now that we've come up with a sort of target ambition, is the consumer research piece. And then moving on to the recommendations, there's no point in doing anything. And um, in all my years at RAP, everything's underpinned by the consumer research. What behaviour do we want to change and how do we do it? Yeah, and I think I think that's a really important part to kind of, I suppose, close on as well, is that that idea of the importance of really understanding, like anything when you design a business model, like, you know, you can do it on paper, but until you really go out there, find the data, do the research, get that customer feedback, you know, that's that's when you really mm -hmm. find out what works and, and what potentially is viable as well. Um, yeah. Thank you so much for joining us, Jennifer. We're going to be sharing all the links as well. Great. and. Um, also following up, I think, in our newsletter with some of the, the free tools and stuff that, that are available and are really wonderful that QSA partners are sharing them um, yeah. as well. In our next session, we've got actually a local Reading uh, community interest company called Gifted Boutique uh, lined up who actually do uh, secondhand clothes sales, but also um, raise money for quite a few different charities as well. So we'll be hearing about that and, and how you know creating value from, from otherwise unused or unloved uh, clothing as well. And then following that, uh, we've got Josie Warden, who heads up regenerative um, design at the RSA and has worked in circular economy and textiles as well. So oh, yeah. we've got a few other interesting sessions that I think will be really um, great to pick up on some of those elements and those business model bits that you've talked about uh, today, Jennifer, as well. Yeah, so, sure. But yeah, and if anyone's got any specific questions, do have a look at the learning platform and, and then do get in touch and we can have a chat with you. Brilliant. Um, was there anything else, Sophie, that I should have? I think that's that's all. Anyway, I think thank you all for joining us today for the Circular Coffee Conversation. Um, we'll uh, be, once I get around to it, putting the, the recording on our YouTube um, channel, which is Circular Coffee Conversation. So you should be able to find this one as well as a load of other uh, brilliant on you know, conversations and organisations we've chatted with today. Brilliant. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. See you again soon. Right. Bye. Bye.